And now it is my great pleasure to introduce the last speaker of this session, Kimberly Keaton, who is another one of Dave's students, got your PhD here, and uh, naturally, being one of Dave's students, has gone on to do great work. So uh, Kimberly's specialty, and I'm sorry that I didn't know you more before, but it's self-managing storage systems. She worked on IRAM, characterizing workloads, and uh, intelligent storage. And um, apparently, Kimberly, and I'm stealing this joke from my folks at IBM Almaden, you've been in storage a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I, uh, like Mark and Garth, I came in to, to grad school at Berkeley at the tail end of one project. In my case, it was the RAID project, just in time to participate in the end of project video, um, which uh, Dave then proceeded to trot out on every new project, saying, look, you too can be part of one of these videos by the time the project wraps up. So thanks for that. You can actually see this now on, on YouTube if, if you're interested. Um, all right, so um, now I'm at, I'm at Hewlett Packard Labs, which is the research arm of Hewlett Packard Enterprise, one of the two companies that was formed when HP split this last fall. And so today, I'd like to talk with you about um, a program that we're working on called The Machine. It's a, a new architecture for storing and uh, uh, processing and communicating data. Um, and this is a joint venture between the labs as well as several of our business units. So we're used to thinking about uh, computing in a very processor-centric way, uh, thanks to the work by, of the, the NOW project, as well as similar projects. You know, a lot of computing today is, is structured in cluster form. Uh, and so in those clusters, we have nodes that have both computational capabilities as well as memory and storage and whatnot. Um, because it's, it's difficult to actually put a lot of memory in any one node. So the memory of the, the entire system is distributed across the cluster. And in order for these nodes to, uh, uh, to share data with one another, they actually need to communicate by sending messages back and forth. Um, so now in contrast, the machine turns that around and actually makes the memory the centerpiece of the architecture. And so there's a large pool of memory that is then shared between many different computational elements. Um, and so it's fast because it's, it's still memory. Um, and then the, the one final aspect of it, and we've been talking about this a little bit in, in Mark's talk as well as in some of the Q&A, and the, the memory is also non-volatile. So it's able to, to persist the, the data that we are using. And so this combination of shared, large, fast, and non-volatile memory really changes how we think about writing applications, how we think about writing operating system software, and so on. Um, it provides a lot of really interesting opportunities. So just to cover some of the, the essential characteristics of this machine architecture, and I should say that the machine, it's called the machine, and it's not that there's just one of them, but uh, the, the notion of a machine is just that because it's this general architecture and some of these principles apply at many different scales. So it could be a handheld all the way up through, uh, you know, sort of server class and even, you know, rack scale and, and data center kinds of, of computational uh, elements and so that the machine kind of works at all different scales. Um, if you ask me, it, that's what happens when you let the engineers actually pick the name. They come up with something really creative. Um, so, uh, so the machine. Uh, so the essential characteristics. As we've heard, uh, the, the introduction of byte addressable non-volatile memory technologies really means that we're going to start to see a collapsing of the memory and storage hierarchy. So again, these are technologies where they're persistent, like disks and SSDs, so they'll remember things when you take the power away, but they're like memory in that they're fast and you can access them using load and store instructions. Uh, and so that's, that's what allows us to actually think of this, this blurring of the lines. Because of the trends in disaggregation of resources that we heard uh, Amin and some other folks talking about this morning, this trend towards disaggre disaggregation means that we expect that this large pool of, of non-volatile memory will actually be a shared resource um, at the rack scale. And so it'll be shared amongst the different uh, computational nodes uh, in that environment. And so the, the nodes will be able to directly access the pool without having to necessarily talk to any other node in order to access that memory. So it's this, this direct access. Um, and they'll do that via load and store instructions because, it's like, because we're treating it like memory. Uh, and this is enabled in part by advances in optical networking technology as well as things, so things like you know, high radix switches and whatnot. So that allows us to put together a, a memory fabric that has a relatively low diameter. So there are a small number of hops to get from a processing element to the memory system. And so as a result, you know, we'll see low, uniformly low uh, memory latency to get to this large pool of, of, of non-volatile memory. 
That's not to say that the locality doesn't matter. I mean, there's still a role for 3D stacking and co-packaging of memory along, you know, closer to the processor to create a high bandwidth tier of, of memory to complement this high capacity tier of the non-volatile memory that's shared amongst all of the different nodes. So one final trend that's contributing here, um, and we've heard a little bit about this from some of the, 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 the things that Mark was talking about with GPUs, is a trend towards uh, heterogeneous computational resources. Uh, so things like GPUs, FPGAs, and other forms of acceleration in addition to uh, more, more general purpose uh, CPUs. And so well, you know, we believe that there will be heterogeneous compute resources and also that those compute resources are going to be moving closer to the memory system. So this is you know, in tension with the disaggregation story that we heard uh, Amin talking about a little bit earlier. But that provides opportunities uh, to do data intensive processing close to the memory, also to be able to even allow the, the memory to start to manage itself. So we'll see what, uh, what kinds of interesting opportunities and challenges that this kind of an architecture uh, presents for, for software um, as we go through the talk. So just to put this in context, we're familiar with various kinds of system organizations. So the, the shared nothing organization or of, of a clustered system where uh, units of nodes are basically you know, CPUs, memory, and disk that communicate across a network. So we are, we're very familiar with that model. The, extreme, the other extreme is really a large scale-up machine or a shared everything machine where the main communication is happening um, as, through a coherent interconnect using hardware cache coherence. Um, and, and then all of the, the processing elements have access to the same shared memory. So this machine architecture is really a blending of those two, uh, shared something, if you will. Again, that's what happens when you let the engineers pick the names. Uh, <laughs> so so it, it couples the, the notion of the shared memory pool of a shared everything architecture with a large collection of, of computational elements. And so because there are going to be a lot of, of different uh, compute nodes, it's not really practical to have hardware-based cache coherence anymore. So these, these nodes are going to be operating independently but in a coordinated fashion in order to have access to that large pool of shared memory. So the rest of the talk, I'd like to give you some highlights of some of the work that we've been doing, again, to write software, to, to address Luigi's question, um, to, to write software at many different levels of the stack, ranging from you know, the operating system up through data management uh, and other kinds of uh, data analytics kinds of frameworks, as well as even to rethink how we might go about programming systems with a large amount of non-volatile memory. And then if there's time, I'll talk a little bit about some of the prototyping that we're doing for, for hardware. All right, so first up. Um, in, the, in the software space, we've been trying to approach this in kind of two different uh, themes. And so one is really looking at an evolutionary approach that would preserve familiar APIs um, and allow, allow users to actually more easily bring their, bring their applications onto an, a machine kind of an environment. Um, there's also the, the thrust of then, you know, well, let's, let's just rethink everything. So let's throw out the traditional APIs and see what would happen if we, if we really tried to, you know, to work from scratch. And so we'll see elements of, you know, one or either, either of those approaches in the work that, that I'm going to describe. So we, we started talking about this topic a little bit in the Q&A session before. Um, one place where the, the presence of non-volatile memory really, really makes a difference is in the space of, of persistent data management. Um, and traditionally, file systems were developed uh, assuming that storage was very slow. And so what that meant is that there were separate address spaces for storage versus memory. And we had, had to, the file system had to very explicitly move data back and forth between the disk and, and an in-memory buffer cache uh, in order to allow the processor to operate on, on a really fast copies of those data items. Now what this means is, though, uh, that uh, as, as the memory technologies have gotten faster, these software overheads have actually really increased in terms of the overhead, the percentage of overhead that, that um, they represent. So you see here a, a, a graph. Um, on the, on, on the x-axis is really the I.O. latency. Uh, the blue is the software overhead portion of things, and the red is the, the device portion. And so we start with hard drives down here and then kind of work our way up towards faster and faster te technologies. What you see is, you know, for hard drives, maybe the software was less than a percent of, of the overall overhead of doing those accesses. But as you start moving up to, you know, to flash and, and NVM and even in, in memory, this very much starting to dominate the overall cost into the, you know, sort of even 90% of the overall cost of actually doing those I.O. operations. So we really need to get the software overheads out of the way. So we're starting to see a trend towards non-volatile memory aware file systems that, you know, do just that. Uh, they allow us to actually avoid a lot of the copies that were present in traditional file systems and directly map this fast storage uh, copy uh, from non-volatile memory into the, uh, into the application's address space. <clears throat> 
avoiding, you know, avoiding that page cache altogether. So things like the, the direct access or, or DAX uh, sort of extensions um, from things like PM, PMMIO um, are, are allowing us to actually provide that functionality in an open source fashion. And so um, we've been looking at applying these kinds of concepts to some work that we've been doing in the operating system space, um, which we're calling Linux for the machine. Um, and so the basic idea here is to augment and to extend uh, a, tr a familiar Linux uh, operating system to be able to support the machine architecture. And so part of that is allowing that direct access to non-volatile memory. Uh, so that applications don't have to worry about so much software overhead in accessing persistent storage. But another part of it is really about uh, allowing those independent um, uh, node operating systems to cooperate with one another and to coordinate their access to memory allocation to the overall storage system. Um, so that's another aspect of the work that we're doing in, uh, in Linux for the machine. To John's question about, well, why can't we just flush the caches and then doesn't the world make, you know, isn't the world a much easier place to be? Um, so there's also support in Linux for the machine for doing uh, processor caches before a kernel panic so that you can actually get the contents out of the volatile caches onto a persistent storage medium. Um, there's also addi additional support for, uh, for doing atomic kinds of operations through the memory fabric, so uh, compare and swap and that kind of operation, uh, as well as being able to do um, RDMA-like memory transfers between process address spaces, between processes A ad addresses space and process B's address space um, in an efficient fashion. So these are just some of the examples of, of the ways that we're extending Linux. Um, and we've demonstrated versions of the Linux for the machine at one of our trade shows in the last year to 18 months, and we're hoping to be able to, to uh, commu uh, communicate those, those changes back to the Linux community to make them open source. So, that's more in the evolutionary sort of path of doing things. We also have some work that's looking at, well, what would happen if we dramatically changed the way that the operating system worked? Uh, so we also have sort of a clean sheet OS uh, uh, work uh, effort that's, that's going on um, that's in, done in collaboration with several university partners um, uh, across, the, across the world. And so, you know, there are a variety of different technique, technologies and, and ideas that we're, we're uh, looking at there. And so one of them is in the space of, of address spaces. Um, and so a uh, recent paper that, that we had at ASPLUS actually looked at what would happen if we made the virtual address space a first-class citizen. Uh, and so the idea would be that a process wouldn't have just one virtual address space. It would have multiple virtual address spaces that you could then switch between in a very efficient fashion. And this would allow you to... Uh, you know, to, to take advantage of the fact that you know, the memory that we might want to address is actually much larger than the physical address space of the, of the processor. So that's one advantage. Another advantage is that it potentially allows different processes to share data very effectively because you can just define the virtual address space and then be able to, to have multiple processes access that. It also allows efficient versioning and, and checkpointing of, of the data that's actually stored in the, in the address space. And so um, we have implementations both in traditional operating systems, you know, POSIX operating systems like BSD and, and Linux, as well as Barrelfish um, from ETH Zurich. So we haven't stopped at the operating system, though. We've worked our way up the stack. And so one of the, one of the other places that we've been looking at is in, uh, is in transactional data management. Um, databases have a similar problem as the file system in that uh, as storage becomes much faster, the overheads start to dominate the overall cost of doing business. Um, and so this is a, a study that was done almost 10 years ago, actually, looking at the overheads in transactional, transaction processing workloads for databases. And so what you'll see is that, that the overheads associated with you know, dealing with slow storage, so the buffer management, the fact that logging has to operate uh, you know, in, in conjunction with a persistent slow storage device, these kinds of overheads are starting to dominate the overall cost of doing, uh, doing transactional workloads. And so if we could eliminate those or dramatically shrink them, then there's an opportunity to have these systems work much more efficiently. And so one, uh, one of my colleagues has been doing work in this space looking at uh, a transactional storage engine. Uh, it's called FOTUS. And so the basic idea here is you know, to build from scratch um, a storage engine that, um, that will take advantage of non-volatile memory and to do that in an efficient fashion. Also to take advantage of you know, highly scalable multi-core processors and, and to be able to, to scale the, the workload in, in response to, to that kind of an architecture. And so the basic design is, is designed to eliminate as many synchronization bottlenecks as possible. So for example, it, instead of using lock-based uh, uh, pessimistic concurrency control, it uses optimistic concurrency control. So in layman's terms, you know, it's basically asking forgiveness rather than permission in order to, uh, you know, to, to do a, a transaction. 
Um, in addition, it decentralizes the logs, so each core has its own log, so there's no contention for being able to, to commit things to the log. Uh, and uh, additionally, uh, transactions commits are actually buffered together into these, these periods called epochs, and so one can tune the duration of an epoch in order to, to get the desired performance and, and durability characteristics that you, that you desire. And so this is a, a system that, uh, that we built, and you know, it's been uh, demonstrated uh, in a Sigmod, uh, Sigmod paper last year, and it's open sourced. People can take a look at it. What we see is that um, you know, the combination of these different techniques actually allows us to, to achieve orders of magnitude performance over other in-memory data stores, like, uh, like HStore, which is the academic version of, of VoltDB. Um, and so, uh, as, as a final point, in terms of the usability of this, it's also, it's available as, a, as a, a library that one can link into an application. So, if one wants to actually have transactional management of persistent data, one can just use the FOTUS library, um, and that would be provided for, for the application. We've also been looking at, uh, at data analytics, um, and so, uh, the the basic notion of, of, of clusters has meant that the data analytics have traditionally been designed, you know, in the Spark model basically, where you know where you actually send messages back and forth in order to share data um, in, in that kind of an environment. Uh, so the observation here is that with shared memory, we could actually do that much more efficiently and actually do, do data sharing through the memory system itself. So this is just some work that we've done, an initial prototype around a, a graph processing environment. Um, and so the basic idea here is that uh, the computation is a bulk synchronous parallel kind of computation. It proceeds in phases, where during each phase there's a local computation on the, the local partition of the data. Uh, and then there's a communication phase where the, the nodes are communicating uh, intermediate results with one another. Um, and so if instead of sending messages to do that communication, we actually write to a shared memory buffer and then ring a doorbell to say that the data is ready, um, then, the, then the receiving node can actually just read directly from the shared memory pool uh, in a much more efficient fashion. And we see that that's, you know, that, that definitely bears out in the, in the results that, that we see. The, the in-memory version of things is much, much faster uh, than, than the, the, the network-based, uh, the network message-based uh, option. And so we're applying these similar ideas to, uh, to Spark, and so we've actually demonstrated a, a, a big memory version of Spark that actually takes advantage of a shared memory pool in order to dramatically improve uh, our ability to do data shuffling. All right, so that's looking at sort of preserving pr traditional uh, application uh, models and, and data management models. I also have colleagues that are looking at what happens if we dramatically try and rethink the way that, that we interact with persistent data. So do we really need separate data representations between uh, an on-disk or storage representation of that data, which is serialized, versus an in-memory representation, which is not? Um, and so the, the hypothesis is that if programs could actually just operate on persistent versions of their data structures, we could actually have a much more efficient way of, of interacting with persistent data because we wouldn't be paying these serialization and deserialization costs. Um, and so that sounds good in, in principle, but in practice it turns out that persistence doesn't necessarily equal consistency of, of the data. And so uh, let's, let's talk through this in a little bit more, uh, more detail. And so, so some of this we've, we've seen a little bit. So this will be a quiz for those of you who are attending, uh, attending Mark's talk. So let's, let's imagine an application where I, I've written my application and I'm accessing persistent data. And I want to do a transfer between two different accounts. Um, and so what would happen if I crashed after I had debited the first account? Would, you know, would the system come back and see a, a consistent view of the data? How many people think that that would be successful? Okay. Correctly, no one is raising their hand. Very good. All right, so now here, here comes the quiz. What, what happens if instead I'm able to finish the transaction, so I've credited the new account as well as debiting the old account, and I crash after that? Am I, you know, am I still going to be able to see a consistent view of things when the application comes back up? How many people think yes? Okay, got some hands? All right. You know, not necessarily. So what happens if the state of this transaction, the updated state of this transaction, is still in the processor's caches, and I haven't been able to necessarily flush those processor caches before the system has gone down? In that case, you know, or alternately, I've, I've, I've persisted only you know, one of the two operations, then it's possible that we're going to see an inconsistent state of the world when the application comes back up. So even though I've, I've made some things persistent, you know, that a crash may actually cause corruption, and that'll confuse the applications as they try and recover. So 
the work that my colleagues are doing um, is, is trying to address that problem. So one way of doing this would be to go back and instrument that debit and, and credit kind of, of transaction with a lot of uh, instrumentation to do to create an undo log so that you would be, always be able to actually undo any operations that had been persisted. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to have to write that code. I mean, it's very, it's very error prone and, and very tedious. And so you know, we, we want to be able to, to allow application writers to benefit from this kind of logic, but not necessarily have to do this tedious work. Um, and so the basic idea here is, you know, let's, let's look at the, the you know, consistent sections or critical sections of a multi-threaded application um, and, and use those as our guide to figure out where it makes sense to actually persist data. And so if we can define these kinds of, of, of regions, then we can also define when should I make the, the, the data durable. Um, and also, imply, have, have some ordering implied. So if, if one of these consistent sections is, has been made uh, persistent, then anything before that has also been made persistent. Five minutes. Okay. And so the system that they've developed is called Atlas, and it was published at Uppsala in 2014. Um, and the basic idea there is that programmers will explicitly distinguish between persistent and transient data. And the, the persistent data lives in a persistent region. Um, and so, so you allocate your memory from that persistent region, and then it, it, it is persisted for you uh, on your behalf. So it is memory still, so you can access it via load and store instructions. Um, and the idea is that the programmer will just write a normal multi-threaded application uh, using locks, and then you know, the, instrument, the, the compiler will look at where those locks have been placed and use that as a, as a guide as to where it's going to, to declare where these consistent sections are. And then in conjunction with you know, instrumentation from the compiler as well as a runtime system that will do the logging, the appropriate logging under the covers, you actually are able to then you know, have, have the durability happen when you want it to happen as opposed to in an inopportune time. And so this, uh, you know, this, this really allows the, the programmer to, to gain the benefits without having to do much explicit work. Um, and so again, this was uh, published uh, a few years ago, and we're in the process of trying to open source that as well. All right, we're actually building hardware. We're building this machine, um, and I want to tell you a little bit about that. Um, so, so. We're in the process of, of actually building the hardware here. Um, and so the way that the system is getting constructed, this is a, a mock-up of some of the, the nodes um, that we see. Um, and so we have our computational nodes um, that are an SOC plus hundreds of gigabytes of, of local DRAM um, and plus an Ethernet uh, interface. Um, and then there's the way that it's packaged, even though the, the fabric attached memory is a logical pool that is shared amongst, it's a globally logical pool, single pool that's shared amongst all the different computational nodes, the way that it's packaged is as a part of the node. And so you see that each of these node boards also includes some amount of the fabric attached memory. In our case, you know, a small number of, of terabytes of fabric attached memory. Now the, the memory uh, semantic interconnect allows any node to talk to any portion of this fabric attached memory without talking to another another node another processing node uh, in the in the process and so one of my colleagues likes to call this uh, emancipated memory because uh, memory has has been emancipated from the tyranny of the of the processor basically um, so so we have an, a, a large emancipated uh, pool of, of of fabric attached memory here. Um, and so one other point to, to point out, you may look at this and say, well, golly gee, what, what happens if one of the, you know, the, the power of the processing node goes away? Does that mean that I lose the, the fabric attached memory that's associated with that processing node? Um, we've thought of that. Um, and so the, there is act, are actually separate power domains for the fabric attached memory from the processing uh, domains. And so as a result, you know, even if a node, if process, an SOC actually fails, then the memory that's associated with that, uh, that, that node does not fail. And so uh, the, the existing processing nodes can still access the, 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 fam the fabric attached memory, um, even though the, the, the processing node may have failed. So, uh, in 2016, we're putting together a, a prototype of this, and so you know we talked about the, the composition of a node. Um, if you put about 10 of those nodes in an enclosure, uh, you could see as much as 40 terabytes in a 5U enclosure of, of fabric attached memory, um, and then if you put a number of those, eight, up to eight of those in, uh, enclosures in a rack, you could see as much as 320 terabytes in the short term of fabric attached memory. Um, and so for now, because there isn't a, a large amount of, of, of byte addressable non-volatile memory available, uh, DRAM is playing the role of, of fabric attached memory in these prototypes. But in the future, as we build out you know, additional prototypes, you know, that will be a, a non-volatile memory technology as well. Um, and we anticipate that the capacity is going to go up. Two minutes if you want mm -hmm. to take questions. Okay. 
And, and so, you know, again, uh, the, the scale of this is such that it's not practical to have hardware-based cache coherence, so there is a, more of a scalable coherence model. Uh, so there's no hardware cache coherence between the nodes, even though each SOC actually has a traditional hardware cache coherence model within the SOC. So that, that scalable coherence is provided through a combination of, of fabric-attached memory, atomic operations, as well as uh, software support for flushing caches and, uh, and invalidating caches. Um, and I will briefly say that, you know, of course, you know, the, the software work cannot, uh, cannot only start once the hardware becomes available. So we are also working on emulation techniques um, and simulation techniques. And in particular, we've got a, a QEMU virtual machine based uh, emulator that we're also looking at uh, that we've built and we've open sourced. So with that, I'll wrap up uh, and say that the, the machine, which combines, you know, makes, uh, it has a very large pool of, of shared memory that's then uh, accessed directly by a large number of different computational nodes. Um, allows, machine, uh, the machine has large memory, which is fast, it's non-volatile, and it's shared. Um, and the combination of those different things really allows us to think very differently about how we structure software, all the way from the operating system up through the stack uh, to the application level. And so we think that it's a really interesting set of challenges, and uh, we're excited about, about working towards solving them. So with that, I'll pause, and, uh, and this is some of the research, and I'll take questions. Well done. Yeah, so Kim, that was a great talk. I have one question about how your software um, handles um, making all of memory persistent, because one big advantage of a file system is let, much like when you move, you get to do a copying garbage collection on your life and leave various relationships and things you don't like behind. Um, when you put things out in the file system, you get to do the same thing with your data. But when now everything is in a big persistent memory, you have huge amounts of garbage. And I will point out that many things reachable from your root set are garbage. How do you deal with that problem? So garbage collection is very much a part of the systems that, that we're looking at. And so you know, some of the work that we've done in, in a managed data structure environment, you know, that the goal is to be able to have you know, parallel garbage collection that will go off and actually clean up that garbage that we don't need anymore. And so that's definitely one of the research topics that we're looking at that I didn't have a chance to talk about very much. Uh, Kim, Mike Olson from Cloudera. Um, I have one comment and one question. Uh, the comment is I feel like somebody has to channel Stonebreaker in this thing. We've already figured this transaction crap out. If you'll just read the papers, Kim, we'll save you a lot of time. Um, we we the, have been reading papers, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> the, the, the question more usefully. Um, so a lot of great work has been done in file systems over the years. I mean, the log structured work that John and Mendel did, uh, a fantastic example. Do file systems matter if you've got the sort of non-volatile sort of persistent storage that you've got today? And if they do, who is doing interesting work in that way? Is that is, do we need new data structures? Do we need, need new interaction models uh, to talk to data in order for it to be persistent? Mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, file systems, there's definitely a role for them still. I mean, part of the file system is to provide a hierarchical namespace, and so people still you know, cause and effect, I'm not sure which is which, but you know, people still think very much in terms of hierarchies, and so the ability to name things with those hierarchical names, you know, is something that people will still want to be able to do. Um, the, all the copy operations, eh, that's out, uh, that should be thrown out. I mean, you know, so the direct access is definitely very useful. Um, but, you know, there's new ideas that we're looking at because memory is very, very large, you know, finding the appropriate thing is gonna be difficult, so, you know, actually being able to couple, uh, couple files, what we traditionally called files with metadata that would, you could then search, you know, that would be a very, very useful thing for being able to actually find things. And I know, again, I have read the papers, I know Margo has been talking about this for a while, but those kinds of ideas I think are very, very appropriate in these kinds of, of large memory environments. Um, so in terms of the, the direct memory access, there are a number of different, uh, you know, different groups that are looking at that, folks at Wisconsin as well as San Diego, uh, CMU and, and so on. So. I, I think we'll take one last question and then you can catch her at lunch. Great talk. Is there a... So Jim has a question, I think. Okay. You pick, you oh, pick. I don't. <laughs> How important is it to minimize the number of writes to non-volatile memory because the costs of reads and writes are different? Right. Um, so, so I think... Different technologies have different characteristics, and so the asymmetry of the performance, you know, differs, obviously. Um, similarly, the endurance, you know, is, is a question, right? And so I think that, you know, there's a lot of interesting work that's going on or starting to go on in terms of write-avoiding algorithms, and so that, that is a very interesting thing to look at. Um, so, you know, some of the work that you've been doing as well as some of the work that folks at CMU have been doing is, is, is definitely useful. Okay, great. Thanks okay. again. Thank you.